Well, welcome, Dr. Melissa Riley. I am so honored to have you here. Oh, it is my pleasure. I am excited to be part of your podcast and um, I'm thrilled to talk more with your audience. I was so excited when I saw your topic about how you work with women who may have either lost their moms or perhaps may have a, a, a less than ideal relationship, but there's more to it. Maybe you can elaborate. Yes, I'd love to. So I have been a clinical psychologist for 23 years. And when I became a mom about 12 years ago, I was really surprised by just how overwhelmed and incompetent I felt, despite having all the education and background and confidence that I had. Um, and it took me some time before I realized that there was a significant impact on me because I didn't have my own mother. And there are many women out there like me who don't have a loving mother by their side, either because she's passed away or because they don't have a loving emotional relationship. And so I did some research and there isn't a lot of information out there. So I spent some time developing a program specifically designed to help moms like myself that don't have a mother in their life. And so about a year ago, I started a coaching program specifically for moms without a mom. I find that to be such a heart-centered way of approaching your skills and years of experience, particularly I think when we are able to give that gift from a place where we've already experienced the journey and the pain. Now, mm -hmm. with your mom, can you share a little bit about um, what your relationship is or was? Sure, absolutely. So growing up, I was really close with my mom. I thought she was um, you know, larger than life and I worshiped her. Um, I wanted to be just like her. And it wasn't until you know, I went to college and started to figure out who I was as a separate person that I realized that my mom, like all of us are flawed. And we started to have some conflicts. Um, and unfortunately, uh, some of those conflicts led into an estrangement. And so we didn't talk for about eight months and then she died unexpectedly. So we weren't able to work through our issues prior to her dying. And so I was only 25 at the time. And um, I went through, you know, typical grief process and didn't become a mother myself until just a few days shy of my 38th birthday. So I had many years to grieve the loss of my mom. Um, and so went through marriage, you know, and, uh, you know, graduate school, I started careers and moves and had many changes in my life. And so knew what it was like to be an adult without my mom. But then um, once my younger son was born, uh, really struggled. My older son uh, came into my life when he was already three years old, because he uh, is my husband's from a previous marriage. So that was a little bit of a different journey for me than once I gave birth to my own son. I expected that to be really joyous, but unfortunately uh, I was overwhelmed with grief and, and didn't recognize that what I was feeling was grief. I just thought there was something wrong with me because I was just really, really sad. I was longing for my mother. I was so worried that I would do things the wrong way. And frankly, I didn't have anybody to ask. I didn't have any help from anybody. I didn't have any other female re relations uh, because both my sisters also had, had passed away previously. So in many ways, I was very much alone. Whereas my husband had already been through the experience of being a dad. So he felt much more comfortable and it was a little harder for him to understand 
where I was coming from. I wonder if some of the pressures that you might have described, maybe the word pressure is not entirely accurate, but that grieving process is also from the fact that as women, we often feel like it's our role to nurture, but we also seek nurturing. At least I often feel that way for myself. And that's a place of energy that requires a lot of inner work. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I have always been a very nurturing and other centered individual and very empathic. So it was hard for me to turn inward and really look at what was going on. And unfortunately, when we aren't able to identify what we're experiencing, when we don't have an awareness of what's going on, we often turn inward and blame ourselves, which is what I did. I felt a lot of shame and I just didn't understand why being a mom was so difficult for me, despite the knowledge and background I had. And so I just thought I was a bad mom. Now I realize now that that isn't the case. And I realized through working with moms, because I continued to work as a psychologist with lots of moms after my son was born, that there were other women like me who didn't have uh, a mother. And there were some common patterns I began to see emerge. And so I started thinking about it being the psych nerd that I am and realized that there was something to this, that it wasn't that I was a bad mom, that it was much more than simply me not having um, the support of her in my life. There were uh, features that moms without a mom have that others that do have their mom don't. So for example, mothers tend to function as a go-to person. So they provide assistance and support. Uh, They can help out in emergencies and they're available, you know, when their daughters need them typically. But if you're a mom without a mom, you don't have that. You can't seek out advice from them. So you need to build a community of moms or other individuals to fill the roles that your mother would have played. Another experience that's very common for moms without a mom is that they can experience grief in unexpected ways. Not only grief, but also sometimes feelings of missing out like they don't have something that others have. And sometimes that can come across as jealousy or even resentment. And then the third feature that is very common amongst moms without a mom is some difficulty figuring out who we are as a mom. So that identity development, because if we don't have a mom in our life, it can be hard for us to figure out who we want to be as a mom. And if we had a difficult relationship with our mother, then that can add some even more um, problematic issues, right? Wanting to be different or not wanting to make the same mistakes. Or if we had a really good mom, then we can feel guilty or feel like we're betraying her if we try and walk in our own path. So there are a lot of those complicated Um, factors when it comes to creating our own sense of who we are as a mom. Oh, it's so profound. My mom had lost her mother um, relatively young. And then I feel like my mom, relatively to what I see among my girlfriends out there, is that their moms are still around. (laughs) And so Mm -hmm. I, I can relate to so many facets of these features you described And often I feel guilty that I have at times felt, uh, I don't want to say resentment, but a a little bit of envy when others have their mom, like when Mother's Day came and went. And um, I could describe the fact that when my son was being taken care of, because she was around for the first two years, Uh and I thought at the time that she was like, this is a weird psychological thing I went through, but I was an older mom and I always felt like, well, 
she, she's like the real mom because she was like the ultimate nurturing caring yeah. one and I was like the big sister because <laughs> I had right. all this hormonal rage like and I wasn't good enough and I always felt like that like right. and then she suddenly passed suddenly all family members were relying on me and it was difficult yes absolutely and then you had the added burden of needing to grieve yourself and then help your child, right? Who lost a grandparent and the other members of your family and you needed to deal with all of that, absolutely. And so, you know, that the feeling of envy is very common, but it's so hard to talk about, right? Because we're happy for our friends, right? We, you know, that's awesome, they have that, but yet we don't, right? And, and so, you know, it can be a very taboo topic. And what's, again, when somebody passes on rather unexpectedly at a young age, it's a perspective on time because I now see like many, many years later, um, the moms of these friends are still thriving. They're traveling the world, doing things. So yes. it it changes your feeling of um, hope. But I, I'm coming out of that dark space, but mm-hmm. I, I can relate to that. Yeah. Yes. You know, you know, sometimes I get the question, right? How is it that I help women? Because, you know, for example, my mom's dead. She's not coming back. Right. And so it isn't like I can ever have her be replaced. Right. That isn't going to happen. But I now recognize when I get triggered, I recognize those situations when grief occurs or when I might feel a little bit of envy. I recognize what to do in an emergency and I can't just call her up. I know who to call. So I have strategies now and I know myself better with regards to what is making me feel uncomfortable. And so that, you know, is some of the things that can improve. And so, you know, even though our situation may not change, the way we respond to it, the way we feel about it, what our expectations for the future are, can change. And and that's what is really exciting in the work that I do, is being able to change that sense of, you know, futility or helplessness, or, you know, just that, that sense of, you know, how can it get better? Because, you know, she isn't going to be in my life, you know, either because she can't be or, I know that she just won't be, you know, for those that know their mother isn't going to be different if she's still alive. And I do know some people who've had a contentious or somewhat challenging relationship with their mothers. And then I, I would say that for myself, it was a very uh, loving, deep relationship. Yet I argued all the time with her (laughs) and I, I, and it it was possible for myself to recognize that it's loving and deep. And at the same time, she and I could be challenging yes. with one another. Yes, absolutely. You know, yeah. conflict in mm-hmm. and of itself doesn't mean that the relationship is poor, mm-hmm. you know, or or you know, unhealthy. It's it's how you manage the conflict and how you resolve it. And is there that mutual respect and regard within conflict? You mentioned uh, there are strategies and I, that really, I tuned into that term because often when I work with people, whether it's on a personal or professional level, I think of each person is fluid and different, Mm -hmm. yet there are strategies that may be applicable in terms of how they can be integrated in one's life. Can you describe some of these strategies that you see common ones that our our viewers can listen to maybe? Absolutely. I I think one of the um, 
easiest, well, not necessarily easy, but one of the most important things is to build that mom community. And when I talk about building a community, I invite people to focus on four types of people. The first person I like to call the wise woman. So this is the person that knows things. So she is knowledgeable and can give advice and is very generous about sharing her knowledge. So um, these people can be other mothers, they can be aunts, they can be um, professionals like coaches, counselors, psychologists, members of a faith community. But this is somebody that you reach out to get your questions answered. And especially for newer moms, there are lots of them. And so you need a, a wise woman in your life. The second is somebody I like to call an emotional supporter. And this is somebody who's really good at listening. So they don't try and give advice or cheer you up. They just let you be where you are because it's important for us to be able to, to share our emotional experiences. The third person I like to call the go-getter. Now, these are the people that are really good at getting things done. So they're goal-oriented. They have lots of energy. This is the friend that can go grocery shopping, um, fold laundry, pick up the kids, and all of that is done before 8 a.m. in the morning, right? <laughs> um, it's not me, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but they just are really good at being task-oriented. And then the fourth person I like to call the late night talker. And essentially, this is the person who is available at off times. And so in today's day and age, this may include our social network friends who live in different parts of the world or um, somebody that we can text or use other technology like WhatsApp or Voxer or something like that, um, that can reach out at different times as well. And the reason I categorize people like this is because most of us don't fit all four categories unless it's our own parent or mother. It is very rare that we can meet all of those roles. So we need to know the strengths of our friends or the people in our life so that when we have a need, we know who to go to, to ask for help. And it can also be helpful if we know our own strengths. So at this point in my life, I'm a pretty good wise woman. And I'm also a good emotional supporter. And so I can help my friends out in those ways. But to be honest, I'm not a good go-getter. I, I wish I were, right? But I still have three loads of laundry in my laundry room. So <laughs> it's just not my strength. And that's okay, right? So I will be the person that takes you out for coffee after other people have helped you get your house put together. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, um, but by reaching out to those friends and those professionals and those coworkers, our acquaintances, when we need those things becomes really important. And knowing who to reach out to also is important because you don't want to wait until you're faced with an emergency to try and figure that out because then you're going to be stressed out and it's not going to work. There's this brilliant categorization of each of those avatars or personas that we gravitate to because the way you've described them, it's coming from an innate need within us and then filling that need. And that's true that as my mom nurtured me, often she would switch between like, sometimes it was the wise woman. Um, she would walk right in if, if I was having like a bad day, um, physically not feeling so great. And she'd be in the laundry room quickly doing things. And I didn't feel any shame in those days. I feel so bad now, but I'd be just like, hurry up and do this for me. I need your help. Like, but you could trust the fact that you could 
just say, I need you. And they're there. Right. Right. And that's because of the nature of a healthy long-term relationship that is unique between mothers and daughters. And again, that's only for that subset of mothers and daughters who have that healthy, long-term connected relationship. And if you don't have that, then you have to create it through a community of other people. And, you know, one person isn't going to fill that for most of us, but that doesn't make them a bad friend. It just makes them human. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do have a few friends over the course of my lifetime who are actually about as old, if not older than my mom, but I often got along with older women. And I think it's because there was some level of wisdom and nurturing that was filling that need. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, how do you find this is sort of coming to me intuitively? The process of helping women connect to those needs and giving them the right strategies. Do you feel like, and I, I feel like this is resonating with me, that it helps you also become a better mom? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because when you know yourself and what you're needing, You can get that assistance, which then frees up your energy to better connect with your children. Because what's really important, Shilpa, is that time, energy, and resources are all finite. We can't add to it. We only are able to divide it up in certain ways. So if you think about the analogy of a pie, right? We can only cut up different pieces. And so when we get assistance where we need it, that frees up some of our time, energy, and resources to put it to our children, to ourselves, so that we can be that mother that we want to be because we can't pour from an empty pitcher If we don't have the resources ourselves, we can't give to others, right? Yes, absolutely. I wish I had had this conversation when I lost my mom because, well, and I think maybe I needed time and space to reflect on what was going on because the shock was so harsh on my heart. Yes. And again, going back to heart-centered awareness, the work that you're doing is very heart-centered. Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the benefits that I bring as a coach is that I'm also a psychologist. Now in the work that I do in my coaching program, it's not psychotherapy. You know, I'm not providing psychological treatment, but I don't stop having the knowledge of a psychologist. So I'm really good at being able to recognize what are, you know, the aspects that the the moms in front of me are bringing with them from their earlier life experiences? What are some of those needs? And I'm really good at picking up on those underlying concerns and issues so that we get to the heart of the problems pretty quickly and then are able to identify, you know, the strategies and the tools that will help them move forward in being the mom that they want to be for themselves and and their children. I imagine also this approach you have in the service will not only help you perhaps go through the healing process Mm -hmm. as an individual, regardless of what type of relationship you have with your mother, but perhaps also improving general relationships around you because while you're going through what you're going through being the role model or being the mom being the wife being whatever you are to different people these tools are needed like when I went Mm -hmm. through losing my mom one of the harshest things was it happened quickly quickly people were relying on me as an emotional um whatever it needed to be and I went back to work immediately and I I thought it was too immediate, like within less than two weeks. 
and I remember some guy approaching me in the hallway going, so are you all better? And I, I'm right. like, I was taken aback, like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, you look really sad for a few days, but is everything better now? And I go, I lost my mom. <laughs> so right. there is no better, right? There's no better. Right. But I think that speaks to our culture, right? This idea that people are uncomfortable with grief. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think what's, what's a really important message, you know, for your audience is to recognize that grief is simply an emotion. It is not something to be scared of. It isn't something to avoid. It's an emotion like happiness, sadness, love, joy, and that it's okay to experience it. And, and we experience it for the rest of our life right? So I no longer fear my grief. I know I'm going to have it. I don't try to avoid it, but I know how to recognize it. And I know what to do with it so that it doesn't negatively impact the joy that I also experience. So for example, my son just, um, had a significant part in his elementary school musical. And it was so much fun to watch him perform. And in the middle of it, I had this really strong urge to turn to my mom and start talking to her about it. Mm. And, you know, then there was sadness. And so I knew that was grief. And so I just simply gave myself an internal hug. I talked to her in my mind as if she were there. And then I continued to watch him on stage and enjoy the moment. So, you know, it's important to recognize what we're going through, to acknowledge it, to validate it, to, to honor it for what it is, and simultaneously give ourselves permission to also be in the present moment that includes the joy as well. And we don't need to avoid acknowledging and recognizing that grief at times is really intense and it's okay. It's okay to shed those tears. It's okay to acknowledge it. We don't need to brush it off or pretend that it is over because it isn't. We will grieve for the remainder of our lives and we can do that unapologetically. Yeah. And recognizing that it needs to be nurtured as a process, what, yes. whatever, however it happens. So yeah, I, I'm so glad you understand that maybe we live in a culture that doesn't quite understand that type. Right. Yeah. Now, how has your, I would, I always think of it as like a healing solution or a, approach mm -hmm. and the strategies helped you in perhaps some way come to a place of peace or healing because you're, you're helping others. Right. Absolutely. Well, uh, like I was saying earlier, you know, there, there are three really important components. It's the, the grief healing, you know, and being able to identify and express and then accept the, the grief as it occurs the second is building communities and recreating and adding and changing and adapting communities at different points in my life and with the different needs that crop up. And then that internal reflection of who am I as a mom? What are my values? What are my priorities? And how are they similar? And how are they different from what my mother's were? And, and really, uh, you know, building that awareness and, and being open to, to changing that. That's wonderful. Well, I look forward to perhaps having you back in the future. We can, I would love that. Conversation. I received so much value from our conversation and it feels healing to many, uh, uh, to a great degree, it feels so healing to know that there are people in this generation who are now recognizing that we need a hand to hold us and hold space for us as we navigate through that type of relationship with our mothers, which can be very painful if it's, it's um, not healed in time. 
Yes. And, and, you know, it's, it's never too late to go through the healing. You know, I work with women who are, you know, newer in their grief process. And I work with women who, you know, as moms passed many years, I work with women who have young children, but I also work with women whose children are adults and they just feel like there's still this place in their heart that, that needs, you know, further guidance to be able to release some of the the pain that they feel. Absolutely. And it's the guidance, the support, the space. It's not, you're replacing the mom. Right. Of course not. Just getting that energy that will help you become stronger. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to sharing your information to the guests in the show notes, and perhaps they'll reach out to you. That would be wonderful. And, you know, everything that we've been talking about, I talk, you know, more fully and deeply about in the, my book, which is called thriving as a mom without a mom. So you can get a lot more in-depth examples and stories and, and those strategies, um, through that. Wonderful. I definitely will uh, place the name of the book and a link in our show as well. Thank you. Uh, Well, have a lovely day. I, I appreciated our conversation. Oh, it's been my honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.